Okay, colligative properties. So this is an actual, pretty important one. Um, so colligative properties are pretty interesting, actually, and we use them all the time around here, uh, especially in the Northeast. Uh, ultimately, what colligative properties are going to look at is the solution properties. So having a solution of, or having a liquid and adding things to it. So if I have water, the density is equal to one. If I add a bunch of salt to it, what we're going to see is the solution physical properties change with added impurities. So if we start with pure water and I add some salt to it, as soon as I add the salt, adding that impurity is going to create a situation where we now have um, we now have different, the, the boiling point is no longer gonna remain 100 degrees Celsius, right? The freezing point is no longer gonna be zero degrees Celsius. The density is no longer one because we've added stuff to it. We've created this impurity. So that's the idea behind physical properties. Uh, phys physical properties change because of colligative properties. Uh, so there are four colligative properties and they're all linked to the first one. So the four colligative properties are vapor pressure lowering, So the vapor pressure gets lowered and we're gonna talk about why that is and ultimately uh, how that leads to the change of these others. So as soon as the vapor pressure lowers, it now leads to a boiling point, uh, boiling point elevation. So by adding salt to water, we are actually going to see an increase in boiling point. We see a decrease in vapor pressure. We see freezing point depression. We see a decrease in freezing point. And then finally, the last one, osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is something that we're going to look at as well. So osmosis, but those the first three are certainly linked. Osmotic pressure is as well, but uh, we don't really talk about those. We haven't really talked about that much. So this is the important part of this. It depends only on the number of solute particles, not the identity. Okay, so that's really important. So I can add whatever I want. In fact, they can use whatever they want, like on the roads to help melt ice the number of solute particles is important. The identity is not, okay? So the identity or the type, right? Doesn't matter what salt I use, as long as the concentration is, Bela's like chewing the wheel on my desk. All right, uh, so as long as we identify the type, uh, we're gonna be fine. So let's take a look at vapor pressure lowering, because this is the one that's important. So first of all, vapor pressure, the idea that I have some substance A going into solution, we're gonna create an equilibrium with the gas phase. So vapor pressure is how easily a particle can just jump into the gas phase, right? So if I seal up a glass, so if you take a water glass and you put it on your bedside table, what you're gonna notice is over time, it just all disappears, right? Because it's, there's a vapor pressure to water. Water slowly evaporates over time just because of, and we talked about heat and like the, the escape velocities and all that stuff. But ultimately, if you seal something up, you're gonna have a situation like this where you have your molecules and you have a bunch that are in gas state. Okay. When you have a solution, a solution, which ultimately what that means is not a pure liquid. So not a pure liquid. So by adding something, uh, adding something, right? So these things are trying to jump out of solution. And up here, we have the pressure of the vapor pushing on the walls, okay? So we have things, and we also, if we have one coming up, we generally have one going down as well. When we create a solution, we actually see a decrease in pressure because the molecules on the surface 
cannot interact with the atmosphere as much. Okay, so if you have a really tall and skinny glass, you're going to get less evaporation if you have a very wide glass. And it's the same idea here. If we kind of take a look at these pure solvent surface molecules versus the solvent with a non-volatile, non-volatile because then it becomes a much more complex scenario. So if I look at the surface molecules of this, right? So there's a bunch of surface molecules for my, uh, my pure substance, right? There's plenty, every single one of these has the opportunity to jump into solution. And it's also interacting. Yeah, so every single one of those has the opportunity to jump into solution. So the percentage of molecules that have enough escape energy to jump out is equal. Now, if I replace some of these with non-volatiles or something that can't actually jump into solution, so let's say that I have a bunch of those. These are non-volatile. As in, I can't jump those out. What are you doing, bud? Uh, as in, I can't, those cannot jump out of the solution. Can hear you. So ultimately what that means is if we look at the number of molecules that can actually jump out of solution, there's less. So I only have a handful, four, that can actually jump out of solution here. Okay, so having less surface area means that less evaporation is gonna occur, which means vapor pressure is gonna decrease. So vapor pressure decreases because there's less surface area for the solution. And that's it, that's the idea of vapor pressure lowering. This is all driven by the idea of Raoult's law. That's what you use to look at it. So the pressure of let's say water, for example, if that, again, this is the, the weird part here is we're actually looking at the pressure of our solvent and not our solute. So the pressure of water is equal to the mole fraction of water times the pure vapor pressure of our water. So that's what that naught is for, for the pure vapor pressure. So this is the pure vapor pressure. Pure vapor pressure of solvent. Oh, she's just licking me in the mouth. Okay, so the pure vapor pressure of the solvent. X, or I'm sorry, chi H2O is the mole fraction of the solvent. And P H2O is the vapor pressure of the solution okay so oh, off you go. all right so again all of these are for our solvent we usually look at solute when we're doing like these mole fractions and whatnot this is solvent in this case okay so that's raoult's law directing uh yeah this is raoult's law okay good so boiling point elevation and freezing point depression so first of all if we, what we should notice is here's my phase diagram. So the pure substance is in, is this black line here. Okay. So what we see, what we notice is we actually, by creating a, by creating a, a decrease in vapor pressure. Okay. We have now, we have now actually adjusted the, the, uh, the gas liquid and pressure solid phase diagram. And ultimately what we see is actually we see a decrease or sorry, an increase in boiling point. We see a decrease in freezing point, all because we have essentially changed the vapor pressure. So changing the vapor pressure of the solution is what actually changes these things. And so the idea is this, if I start, if I take a look at pure water, At 100 degrees Celsius, I know it's, a boiling, it's the boiling point, and zero degrees Celsius, I know it's the freezing point. As soon as I create a solution of it or add salt, we notice that these things are gonna change. I'm going to increase, uh, we're gonna increase the temperature. Sorry, I just wanna look at one thing quickly. 
So the boiling point might become 104 degrees Celsius and the freezing point might go down to uh, 0.5 degrees, negative 0.5 degrees Celsius. So the solution has expanded. So ultimately what we've seen is the range of the solution, range of the liquid phase has increased. Adding impurities creates this range, okay? Why do we salt the roads in the winter? We salt the roads in the winter because it lowers the freezing point, allows us to, the salt mixes with the water, creates a solution, and it allows a lower freezing point, meaning it's no longer gonna freeze at zero degrees Celsius. We're gonna be able to travel it much. See, basically, it's just gonna turn all of that water into, uh, all that ice into water, and we can drive on the roads. So there are two formulas here. Uh, ultimately, these are the important formulas. These are just kind of just recognize that this is basically saying that the boiling point increases and the freezing point decreases that delta. So the change in boiling point is equivalent to Kb, which is a constant, okay, times the molality. So we're using molality here times I. We're going to talk about what the Van Hoff factor is in just a moment, but the times I. So that's the equation, okay? Okay, so... Here are those K values, okay? So those molal, those KB and uh, KF, which you're gonna notice that they are very different. Here's the KB and the KF for freezing and boiling of water. You're gonna have to be provided those or asked to solve for those. Those are not always easy to get. So the idea behind the Van Hoff factor. All right, so the Van Hoff factor is this idea. So there's an ideal Van Hoff factor. So if I have sugar, in the solid form and I turn it into aqueous. So I dissolve it in water. The I for sugar is equal to one. Every single sugar molecule is going to dissolve in solution. NaCl as a solid turning into Na plus and Cl minus, both aqueous. The Van Hoff factor, the ideal Van Hoff factor for NaCl is two because it breaks into two particles. Remember, the number of particles, not the type, is what is important. So the number of particles, not the type, is what is important here. So if I put an ion, ionic compound in, into solution and it breaks into part into multiple, then we are in a situation where we are producing more particles with just one typical substance. So if I look at, how about this one? So FeCl3, solid dissolved in solution gives me one iron and three chlorides. What is the I or what is the Van Hoff factor for this? I is going to equal four, one iron, three chlorides for a total of four particles. And how about HF? HF, which is, um, yeah, maybe we'll use, actually, yeah, we're gonna use this one. Calcium carbonate, CaCO3, which is a, uh, a uh, partially soluble salt. So calcium, two plus, and carbonate, okay, two minus. So the I we want to say is going to be two because it creates two particles. But remember, it's weak. So actually, it's going to be between one and two particles. So some of the time it's one, some of the time it's two, right? So that's the idea of the Van Hoff factor is essentially telling you how much it actually breaks apart. So list the following in order of their expected freezing points. So again, expected freezing points, we are going to take, well, their delta T F is going to equal... Uh, Kf times molal times I. So really the Kf is gonna be constant. So we're looking at that, molality times I. So the molality for each of these, 0 0.050, 0 0.15, 0 0.10, 0 0.050, 0 0.10. And this is really a question about I. How many do these divide? So pause this. Decide how soluble these are and how many particles you're going to get from each of these. So calcium carbonate, so pause these and do the calculation. And then multiply these together and 
you're going to get essentially your delta TF, your relative, I should say, delta TF is going to be based on those two multiplying. The greater the number, the more uh, the, del the delta TF is going to be because you just multiply that by KF. So 0 0.050. So determine the I values, pause this and give it a go. All right, calcium carbonate should break into, maybe I'll just do it down here. Calcium carbonate, or calcium chloride rather, should break into uh, relatives, there we go, should break into three different particles, calcium carbonate, one, one Ca2 plus two chlorides. And that's gonna be 0 0.150. That's gonna be the relative delta TF. Sodium chloride is gonna break into two for 0 0.30. Uh, HCl is a strong electrolyte. It's a strong acid. It should break into two particles, giving us 0 0.20, right? Uh, CH3COOH, I recognize that it's a weak acid. I mean, it's between one and two particles. So that means it's 0 0.050 to 0.1. That's where we expect that one. So it's kind of somewhere in between those two values. And then C12, H22, O11, that's just giant, right? So that's an or organic. There's nothing as carbon, carbon, hydrogen, and that's about it. So this is just going to have a Van Hoff of 1.10. So in terms of their relative numbers, let's just rank these. So this is going to be the uh, lowest freezing point. So we'll call this lowest freezing point. There are five of them. Yeah, so this is going to be number one. Uh, point two, so this is going to be number two, this is number three, and now we have a choice between these two. We know that it's not going to reach, this is not going to reach the extreme, so I'm going to actually say four, and this would be five as the highest freezing point, or the, yeah, highest freezing point. That's what it, the, that was what would be expected. Again, we're just multiplying by KF to get the delta, and then you do the same thing, assuming this is an aqueous, so that's the idea. So the ideal Van Hoff factor is giving you how many particles it's going to break into. And generally, you're going to see that. The real Van Hoff factor is based on the idea that actually these things can pair up. So what we have here is the formation of an ion pair. You can have an ion pair when you have really large concentrations. Sodium and chloride can actually find each other in solution. And now that we have an ion pair, those things act as one particle, right? So that ion pair is acting as one particle because they're close enough together. So what we knew, what we notice is increasing the concentration equals a decrease in I in real circumstances. So normally we're just going to use the ideal Van Hoff factor, which is based on the number of particles it can create. But here uh, in actual life, you see that they form ion pairs. So what we'll notice is as concentration increases, okay, or so, I'm sorry, as concentration increases, we know, so the limiting value, so this right here is the ideal. These are all real based on, uh, so what we'll notice is if we take a look at something like sodium chloride, okay, sodium chloride is, the ideal value would be two, but we'll notice that really dilute solutions, we're pretty close to it, but as soon as we uh, increase the concentration to 0.1, so 100 fold, you see that it actually deviates quite a bit. And things are not created equally. So first of all, we'll notice that sucrose, which is a non-electrolyte, is going to have the normal value because it doesn't break apart. We don't have to worry about ion pairs because there's no ions to pair. But you'll notice that something like uh, K2SO4 and magnesium magnesium sulfate. Oh, actually, we're not gonna look at those two. Now let's take a look at magnesium sulfate, which is also two. We'll notice that it deviates pretty rapidly. Again, it's because of the size of the magnesium and the size of the sulfate. They behave very differently. Also the charges of those two. So they behave very differently. So there's no real way to identify like, oh, what you, you can't I determine what the real I value is. You have to be given information to say, oh, here's your real I value. All right. Finally, let's take a look at osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure, the idea of osmotic pressure is this. If I have this little U-tube, I have solution on one side, a pure solvent on the other, and I have a semi-permeable membrane, which means only the solvent particles are allowed to transfer 
across, only allowed to transfer across, okay? What's going to happen, and this happens in our cells and our body, and that's why it's osmotic pressure every day, is those water molecules are going to cross that barrier until the concentration is equal on both sides. Once that concentration is equal on both sides, we have a difference in levels because we've essentially equal, equilibrated the uh, water concentration. And we actually have to apply a pressure. So if we push down on this, the pressure exerted is our osmotic pressure uh, that is going to equalize those again. Okay, so that is our osmotic pressure. This is the equation for osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is equal to molarity times RT times I, and that's the idea. Okay, so what is the osmotic pressure? at 20 degrees Celsius of 0 0.002 molar sucrose solution. I'm gonna leave it to you guys to solve this. I'm not gonna actually go back and solve these. Uh, what is the, and that's the different types of solutions that we have. We talked about this, having too much salt outside of the system versus enough salt inside the system. You can create these hypotonic, hypertonic, isotonic. Isotonic is the ideal, but you can create these situations where you can blow up your cells ultimately, all because of the pressure of osmosis. I, we talked about oral rehydration solutions already. Here's a couple more uh, freezing, a couple more colligative properties problems. And actually, I'm just going to go into colloids quickly. Um, so let me see if I want to talk about colloids. Yeah, I guess I'll just mention colloids because I know I mentioned them in class before. Uh, we have a bunch of colloids. Instead of a uh, solute solvent, we now have a dispersed phase and a dispersion medium, and they're quite different. So I'm just going to let you guys read that. Okay, perfect. That is the end of 11, and we're going to get back to everything else, or we're, everything else is going to be done in class, I hope.